is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 425. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. Happy to have you along this week. We've got, on the other end of the line, not the normal guest. We've got our most frequent guest ho- co-host, Kenji Numat the Nummy Egashira. Kenji, welcome back to LR. It's nice to have you along. Number 425? Holy moly, dude. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> We've been busy. Gosh. <laughs> we don't take weeks off, man. We know people need that sweet, sweet limited content. So we uh, we make sure to get it to them every week. And that number just keeps getting bigger and bigger. Yes, it does. Um, how you been, buddy? It's good, to, it's good to talk to you. We did the GP last weekend. Now I got back and just been grinding drafts ever since. My internet's been a little bit shaky, so mm-hmm. calling my uh, ISP and yelling at them a bit. But otherwise, you know, same old same. Going well, going well. Good, good. Glad to hear it. Um, so Kenji and I, uh, we had the privilege of covering Grand Prix Indianapolis just uh, last weekend. And uh, in between, before, after... Occasionally during, we drafted and, <laughs> uh, and we were exchanging ideas, talking about our picks, uh, you know, that kind of stuff the whole time. So I thought, you know what? Luis is super busy, uh, getting tested up for the pro tour. Let's bring Kenji on. I know that he's done a ton of drafts already and we'll get Kenji's, uh, ideas and, and mine as well for first impressions for rivals of Ixalan. So this is a first impression show. This is going to, where we kind of shake things out from what we knew before or what we thought before to what we know now or what we've uh, observed to help get you on track in case, you know, you're, you're having a little hard time finding your footing in the format. So before we get into all that, of course, our sponsor channel fireball.com, they are the place to go on the internet for everything you need magic related, anything that you need, they're going to have it. They got singles. Yes, they have rivals of Ixalan singles right now. No more pre-order. You can just order them up. They'll put them in the mail. They'll get them out to you quickly. And, uh, you know, their service, second to none, they're going to make sure that uh, you're happy. They're going to stand by their product. And if you have any issues, you can just let them know and they're going to fix it for you. While you're there, you can check out awesome free content on the front page of their website with uh, a lot of stuff. A lot of new videos came out uh, recently, some vintage cube in there, uh, a couple of videos from me playing the new set. Uh, There's going to be more of those coming out as well. And of course, the full slate of written content, again, from some of the very best players in the whole world all for free. Check them out at channelfireball.com. You can also support the show directly. This is for people that want to give back. There's a there's always a, a subset of listeners and fans. And you know, you're you're a big uh you you you're certainly aware of this, Kenji. People that will subscribe to your channel rather than just watch it, right? It's not everybody, right? It's a it's a it's a percentage of your audience, but the people that do it, they feel like they're getting something out of watching you stream every day, Kenji, or listening to our podcast, and they, and they appreciate it that they get it for free, and they say, you know what, I want to give a little something back to you, and it's really cool because they get to kind of name their price, right? They can say, oh, yeah, you know, even on Twitch now, they have tiered access, and uh, mm-hmm. it feels so good, right, to, to have somebody who doesn't have to volunteer to, to help you out with what you're doing. That well, keeps uh, me motivated to keep doing it as well, you know, people are really appreciative of what I'm giving back to them. So it's, uh, it goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we feel the same way here. And uh, the way we decided to do it is via Patreon, patreon.com slash limited resources. All the information, if you're interested in such things, is there. Okay, Patreon question of the week. This is uh, something that is exclusive. Again, you get perks for being a patron as well. Similar to on Twitch, how you get some emotes and some special stuff. Uh, here, you know, you get access to the Patreon question of the week thread, for example, and a bunch of other early stuff and neat stuff that, that I'll throw at our patrons. Uh, this one comes from Brian, who says... Hey, Marshall and Luis, my son and I listen to LR together every week. Hey, Brian and son. Uh, Thanks so much for the fun and helpful content. Here's my question. Since uh, Rivals is a bomb-heavy format, and by the way, Brian is is definitely correct. There are a lot of bombs in this uh, format. How do I balance following signals with forcing a color or even forcing a color pair for an early pick bomb? For example, if I first pick Tetsamok, I want to play it whether black is open or not, and splashing double black is not easy. What's your advice? What do you think about that, Kenji? You first pick one of these ex- insane bomb rares. How do you balance it out if that color doesn't seem to be open? It's really hard. Uh, oftentimes with cards like Tetsumok or Profane Profession, uh, Procession, rather, I follow along for the first pack. But you know, if I see no other black cards, or rather no playable black cards in the, in the rest of the first pack, I generally try to move away from it. As I just don't think one card, while you know, maybe one of the best in the format, is worth continuing down that line for. Um, I think especially when a format is so fresh, you want to you wanna stick to what's open and yeah. uh, follow the signals rather than just try to jump in 
and uh, latch on to whatever your first card was. Yeah, it's really interesting to try to figure out where that line sits, right? Because, you know, Luis is of the mentality more generally that you should follow the bomb, that the, these cards sway the game in your direction so heavily that they actually make it worth it to play a bunch of mediocre cards. And his reasoning is sound. He thinks, look, they don't print horrendous cards anymore, right? Like That's true. very rarely. So if you have mediocre cards in in that color, you're still better off with this extreme upside. But, you know, there's a lot of synergy-based decks in this format too, right? There's a lot of decks that need critical mass of certain things, you know, uh, tribes or color or whatever, that, you know, don't really lend themselves. If you if you have a, a deck with those colors that isn't that tribe, yeah, you, you might win a good percentage when you draw your Tetsamok, but if you're just flopping around, you know, in the meantime, you could certainly see, uh, I, I mean, I think you make a strong case for saying, look, you still have to be responsible to draft. It's not like you get to draw your bomb every time anyway. So keep that in mind. It is a, a tough dance to follow. One thing that I like to do is try to keep in mind if I can realistically make my uh, bomb color, my secondary color. So, for example, I first pick Tetsamok, and then I move in on white, and then there's just a couple of black cards in the pack, nothing really to to talk about. Well, I'm pretty likely to get good black cards in the second pack, right? Because I didn't pass anything going that direction, so it's unlikely that the people to my left are in black. And when they pass the cards back to me, I might pick up a few decent black cards. Now, long-term strategy, this isn't good because pack three is probably going to be bad again. But if I can get just enough playables, let's say I pick up an Impale, you know, I, I pick up a you know, some, some other reasonable, uh, you know, a couple of reasonable playable commons. And I've got five or six cards now, maybe four or five even, but one of them Tetsamok, one of them's a removal spell and a couple of okay creatures. If I get lucky and white is open enough that I can fill in the rest of the deck with that, I'll do that. Th that is one thing that can happen. Now it's risky because if white isn't open enough, then you end up, let's say with a normal number of number of playables in white and short on black Well, you're short. Right. You're, you're, you're not going to uh, have a, a functional deck or you're going to have to really scrap it out. So that is a thing that I think you should keep your eye open on. If you're, if your primary color ends up being really open and you feel like, okay, that's, that's a no brainer, right? I got a seventh pick, whatever, you know, good, you know, luminous bonds or some real, you know, Everdon champion or whatever's coming around. Hey, you're probably going to be okay to try to just jam Tetsamok, just scrapping together the few picks you can get. But if that's not the case, you, you're going to have to bail probably. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like if you're reading that signal and you're getting white anyways, if you know that it's open, why not just follow that in the first place? If you're reading the signals to get to that point to to allow you to play your huge bomb mm -hmm. uh, and maybe a few other cards, cards in its color. So in these cases, I think you just follow what's correct, especially like Marshall was saying, this is a tribe-based format, right? If you're white-black and you have Tetsamok, but you're playing pirates and dinos, yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> what's going? You're just, gonna, you know, you're just gonna get run over by turn one Merfolk Mistbinder, turn or turn one uh, Miscloak Herald, yeah. into mis, you know Merfolk Mistbinder or whatever. So it's exactly. So keep that in mind, and and it's a good question, Brian, because these things are not easy. But hopefully, we've given you a little bit of structure around it. But you know, I gotta I gotta say what Kenji said is true. There are times when you have to bail. You do have to bail sometimes if, if every signpost is telling you, no, this is not the way to go. It's okay to, to not play your bomb. You know, we always want to say, we always say, don't get married to your first pick. Now, of late, like I've said, I, we've actually uh, veered over a little more to like, well, maybe go to marriage counseling with your first pick, <laughs> but, uh, but you, you do need to be able to let go. Okay. Let's do some cracker packs, Kenji. Uh, these are the first ones for rivals of Ixalan and we'll use these as kind of a springboard for our discussion, but we've got a lot of stuff to talk about as well. Uh, so this one comes from William. Excuse me, Will from Seattle. He says, love the show. Thank you, Will. I remember Will gave this to me at the uh, pre-release that I did. Ooh, yeah. shivers from the crack oh. packing. Ooh. Oh, my God. You should smell this thing. Ugh, so. I haven't cracked a pack in so long. Oh, so good. Um, all right. First card out, River Darter. And I'm going to be reading these just uh, for people that you know haven't drafted as much as you and I have, Kenji. Mm -hmm. uh, two and a blue for a 2-3 merfolk that can't be blocked by dinosaurs. Meh. Yeah, filler. It's just whatever. Uh, here's a card I wanted to talk about. Fanatical Firebrand. Red for a 1-1 mm -hmm. Goblin Pirate with haste, and you can tap and sack it to do a damage to a creature or player. Yeah, pretty pretty good in this format. Yeah. There are a ton of one-toughness creatures that come down early and have some sort of evasion, whether it be your 2-1 Menace Goblin Trailblazer or 2-1 Effective Flying Kite Sail Corsair. This card does a lot of work. Plus, Pirate, 
good synergies. Yep, totally. I, I have found this card much more playable than I thought. I do have to sort of pull myself, like you don't want to run three of them necessarily unless you have some real serious synergies going on. But I think the first one uh, holds its own in, in most decks. Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, Suncrested Pterodon is next. It's four and a white for a two five dino. It's got flying and it has vigilance as long as you control another dinosaur. And for some reason, I always think it's a uh, city's blessing, but it's another dinosaur. <laughs> Uh, pretty mediocre, right? It does block basically everything in the format. Mm-hmm. I think it's a little bit better than people give it credit for, but yeah, filler. Okay. Uh, what about Recover? I've seen people play this quite a bit. I've even started playing it. Two and a black sorcery. Return a creature card uh, from your graveyard to your hand. Draw a card. I think it's actually pretty good as a one of in most decks, and then it obviously gets better if you have, uh, say, Legion Lieutenant. That's the Vampire mm-hmm. Lord or, you know, Chupacabra or... So any any of those high value targets, which there are a lot of that you can get at uh, oh, yeah. uncommon, and I mean if you get like a Tetsamok or something, sure. Yeah, <laughs> just being able to rebuy is so nice, and the fact that it can trips, uh, it's you know draw a card as well as the ability on the card, it's just extra value. Yeah, you know one one way to think about it is think of it kind of like a divination, except for that you're guaranteed mm-hmm. to get a spell whenever you cast it, and then you might yep. even get two. Um, one thing I like that you mentioned as well is. Uh, combining it with with cheaper creatures is good too, right? Like mm-hmm. if you play Legion Lieutenant on two, it often dies, right? It's like you said, it's a high value target. People are going to kill it if they have the chance to. You know, you can build out your board and then turn five, go recover, cast it, right? And th- that's a that's a nice turn. You're still up a card on the transaction, and you got a really important creature back. So don't overlook recover. I think the first one is actually pretty good too. Mm-hmm. Uh, plummet, one in a green, destroy target creature with flying at instant speed. Eh. Whatever sideboard card, Dusk Charger. This is the uh, three and a black three three with ascend. If you get the city's blessing, it gets plus two plus two. Suppose it's playable, I think it's, right? I think it's a uh, surprisingly good, honestly. Not, you, I mean, you're not. Yeah, you're not looking to pick these up super early. They're common, and people don't pick them up um, very highly, or at least as of yet. But uh, you know, a four mana three three in this format is perfectly fine. Perfectly fine. But late game having a four mana five five. That's bigger than most things you're going to fight against. So. so you think it's okay? I think the first one you're almost always playing in all of your black decks. Okay. Um, Cleansing Ray. That's another sideboard card. One in a white. Sorcery. Uh, destroy a vampire or an enchantment. Um, this one's good. I, this might even be our, our first pick here. Uh, Jungle Born Pioneer. Ooh. Yeah. That's my uh, vote for best green common. Ooh. So two and a green, two, two. And when it enters a battlefield, you get a one, one blue merfolk with hexproof. So you're getting three power and three toughness spread over two creatures for three mana. And they're relevant in the sense that they're both merfolk, which can absolutely matter in this set. Yeah. Three, three drops need to be either large enough to deal with the cheaper creatures or produce multiple creatures like this one does to be able to block them. And this, Again, being in Merfolk, being in an important tribe makes it that much better. What are the contenders for best green common? Uh, maybe like this or Hunt, Hunt the Week. Week. Yeah, something like yeah, that. Uh, that's about yeah, it. Guilt Grove Stalker is the two drop. There's also Hardy Veteran. Uh, like those, Both of the two drops are, are good, but I don't think they are anywhere close to the Jungleborn yeah, Pioneer. No, I think you're right. I'm just taking a quick look at the set, and, and I think you're 100% correct. Um, and, and that would be my first pick right now. Are you on board with that as well? Yep, All I right. like it. Uh, Buccaneer's Bravado. This is one in a red Ooh. instant. Yeah, choose one. Target creature gets plus one, plus one, and gains first strike until end of turn. Or target pirate gets plus one and gains, dun-dun-dun, double strike until end of turn. Explosive. That card ha- only has one line of text Agreed. For me. <laughs> I don't think I've ever given anything <laughs> first strike with it. It's just double strike on a yeah, pirate. That's what it is. And it's powerful. It really is. There's a lot of ways to steal games with this card. We'll talk about it um, a little bit later in the uh, show here. Um, oh, I know you like this guy. I'm a, I'm a little oh. lower on him than you are. Grasping Scoundrel. Oh, wait, no. I'm not you that high him. on him. First pickable. Uh, black 1-1 one, one human <laughs> pirate, and he gets plus 1, plus 0 oh, uh, when attacking. One droppable, not first pickable. Okay, Marshall. fair enough. Uh, what, what do you think about the card in general? Remember, we saw at the uh, GP that in it, in in the what was the finals? I guess uh, one yep. of the players had six of these in their deck. I think it was either it was five, five or six, six, and they just yeah. always had one. Yeah. What do you think? 
Uh, it's a pirate, so it's it's that much more relevant. And the if like if you can get a neck breaker to pair along Ooh. with it, having four power later on in the game makes it great. But I think in this format, it's just so important to curve out early. If you can go like one, two, three, or two, three, four, you're generally so <coughs> far ahead that uh, you know a one, one for one, two, one while attacking is is well worth it. You can actually it. do it. Yep. Uh, yep. Uncommons. First one is called Flood of Recollection. It's blue, blue for a sorcery. It says return target instant or sorcery card from your graveyard to your hand, and then you exile this. Terrible. I almost played one earlier today. But you, you weren't happy about it, right? Mm, yeah, no. It's pretty bad, isn't it? I think so, but if you get enough removal spells, like I was playing some janky four-color brew, you know, being able to get back your Impale or mm-hmm. uh, your crash, <clears throat> crash of Tides or something like that's kind of sure. nice, but... Um, Cacophodon. Yeah. Okay, I like this guy a little bit more. He's a five toughness creature for four mana, yeah. and uh, two power is oddly relevant. You combine this with like instant speed effects of Shake the Foundations, or or even your own fanatical firebrand to untap something else to kind of like ambush them. It's yeah, nice, it's enrage is uh, untap a per- untap a permanent, so that can be a creature. I mean, it it doesn't come up often, but it could. It's fine. I, I'm not going to pick it very yeah, highly. Same. I, I actually like Jungleborn Pioneer still out of this pack. Uh, mm-hmm. Here's another one. Uh, Everdon Champion. This is one white-white for a 2-2 two, two human soldier. It's not a, a relevant tribe uh, in the set, but um, it says prevent all combat damage that would be dealt to Everdon Champion. That card is good, but I think that is one that underperforms. I think so, too. What, yeah. Why don't you... Why do you think that is? Just too uh, small? In white, or? you... Well, it's not that it's too small. It's just the double white makes it a little bit awkward for mm-hmm. sure. You, you normally want to be uh, aggressive when you're in white, and as is the case with this format. So if you're like vampires, you have much better options at the three drop slot. You have like voracious vampire and yeah, whatnot. And exultant it, sky it just marcher. doesn't synergize yeah, very totally. Yeah, it just sits standalone. Agreed. It does feel a little bit out on its own. All right, we've got a rare. It is Arch of Orozka. This is the land Mm. that taps for colorless, but if you've got the city's blessing, you can pay five mana and then tap this to draw a card. I like this card. It's good. It's a good card. I like it much more in sealed. Um, I think generally I pass this along first pick because it's a little bit too slow for my Mm -hmm. liking. There are definitely decks that can support it, but uh, I think the format is fast enough that you don't want to take a land that... You know, you need the city's blessing and before it mana. starts doing anything. Yeah. Now, relevant. the one good side about if you were to take it here, though, is that you're not passing anything super good, right? You're passing a jungle born right. pioneer and Everdon champion, uh, and your options are open. You know, you can play Arch of Araska in most decks and uh, get away with it. So that part is nice, right? You know, you're you're you're, mm-hmm. you're delaying committing to something a little bit, which can be good. Uh, would you take the jungle born pioneer over it? I'd still take the jungle board. Yeah, yep. you just want to kind of get to where you're going. Exactly. And, you know, I don't mind missing out on an Arch of Araska if I don't even end up in green anyways. Yeah, it's, it's really not that big of a deal to do that. I would also take the jungle born Pioneer out of this pack. Okay, let's, uh, let's do another cracker pack. Do it. This, this one, one from... comes from Evan at the Monster Hi, Evan. release. Thank you, Evan. Oh, Thought you were talking about the Magic Online mocks. No, you're talking about. Mox. I'm talking about mocks of boarding house here in uh, in Seattle. So that's where I went gotcha. pre released. Okay. Um, first card, Brazen Freebooter. That's the uh, 3 3 for 4, a red and 3 that produces a treasure when it enters the battle. That's right. It's fine. It's just it's fine. Uh, I, I, I like your term, filler, right? It's just like you, you might run yep. one. Um, Divine Verdict. Fine, fine magic okay. card. Three and a white, instant mm-hmm. destroy target attacking or blocking creature. It's uh, interesting in that it's often very easy to see when it's coming. But mm, yes. also, like, what are you going to do about it? You know? I've, I've had multiple times you where can... I put my opponent on it, but looked down at my hand and realized I don't really – I'm not actually building out my board and stranding their mana here. Like, this is kind of what I have. Right. And in a few more <laughs> turns, I might be able to play another creature. And I don't want to lose that one to Divine Verdict. And, you know, sometimes you just play into it. Usually I just say go. I, I like that idea as well. It's it's a good card, but yes, it is very forecastable. All right. Next is Spire Winder. That's the three and a blue, two, three flyer. But with Ascend, you get plus one, plus one. Good card. Um, 
You can get glutted on four drops in this format, though, so I don't generally take them yeah, too high. That that has happened to me many times. Um, speaking of, here's Dusk Charger again, another four drop. And by the <laughs> way, our next card's also a four drop, though it's a pretty good one. It's Hunt the Weak. So three and a yeah three and okay. a green sorcery. Put a plus one plus one counter on target creature you control. Then that creature fights a creature you don't control. It's good, but uh, again, if you want to be aggressive, a lot of your creatures have higher power than toughness, and so it's sometimes it's uh, hard to effectively yeah, use it. It can be really tough, especially with the two drops. Uh, next is Shatter. That's one in the red destroy target artifact at instant speed, but of course. That's a sideboard card. Uh, speaking of artifacts, here's Gleaming Barrier. Two mana for an 0-4 <laughs> artifact creature wall with Defender. And when it dies, you get a treasure. So you think this would be a good blocker, it's but actually it's actually really not. bad, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. I, I've seen people play this thing and think, okay, I've, I'm, you know, I'm stabilizing the board or whatever. And yeah, I mean... Sometimes it trades for a combat trick and you're actually pretty happy. Um, but other times they just play something bigger and or flying or evasive or whatever. And they, they don't care about your gleaming barrier. Um, Exultant Sky Marcher. We mentioned this one a minute ago. One white, white for a two, three flying. And it is a relevant tribe. It's a vampire. Yeah. It's a good card. Solid. Probably my first pick out of this yeah, pack so far. Uh, Cleansing Ray again. We already mentioned that one. Hey, here's another Jungleborn Pioneer. Ooh, so now it's kind of more of a choice. What do you like more, vampires or, or merfolk, white or yeah. green? So we'll we'll put those two in the in the uh, arena together here, and then we'll we'll figure that out in a minute. Uncommons, uh, enter the unknown. This is green sorcery target creature you control explores, and you can play an additional land this turn. Ah, it. I want this card to be good, but I know yeah, it's no. bad. I, I've tried. I it's did just, try it out. Yeah, it, it was underperformed. I mean, what happened to me was. In one of my very first drafts, my opponent played a two drop and then played Enter the, Unno Enter the Unknown uh, on their two drop and then hit an extra land off of it. it. Actually, sorry, they got a plus one plus one counter off of it. You know, I don't remember what they did with the card. And then they played their extra land and then they played another creature. And I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous, right? Like th that is a lot <laughs> of action <laughs> for this, you know, turn three or whatever. But um, the truth is, is that on average, it's not nearly that good. Uh, it's it's a pretty clunky card, no. ultimately. Um, ooh, this one I do like, and I think I would take this over the Pioneer. This is Crested Herd Caller. Yeah, that's so powerful. Five mana for two, three, three trampers. It's just is, really good. It's yeah. real good. Yeah. I would definitely take it out of this pack. Uh, I just find that power level to be too high to dismiss. The other thing I like about it is it is creating two viable attackers, right? Three, three tramplers are the real deal. But also, mm -hmm. if you do find yourself a little bit behind, it's a pretty nice way to stabilize a, a board on the ground, right? You're creating a lot of power and toughness spread out over two creatures. It's good against the menace creatures, that, of which there's quite a few in the format. And it can just be uh, a, a way for you to help stabilize the board a little bit, but also not giving up the fact that you can start attacking with it pretty soon. Yeah, it's 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 like the groan tester, you know. Yeah. It's you're super aggressive. Turn five comes around, your opponent taps it all. You're like, oh come on, please not crest. Ah! And then they have the crested crest crawler, there. and you're just like, yeah. Dang. And you can't get through it, right? Because I mean, and I've seen nope. a lot of people just jam creatures into it and just like sort of accept the two for one. But that is a way to get way behind in a game of Magic. And and the good news is, like I said, is that by even though it's reasonable on defense, like we're saying, it's, it's actually quite good on defense, as we're saying. It's also very good on offense. Like if you're the one curving out. Oh, yeah. Your opponent's going to have the same reaction, right? They're going to be like five men. Oh no, don't do that! And you're like crested herd caller, go! And they're like, no. So that's that's impressive stuff, right? It's hard to to win both sides of that uh, fight. Next right. one is only just you only get one three three for this card. It's famished paladin. Okay, it's uh, it's fine. I don't like first picking it. I want to be more into vampires already before that thing uh, makes my deck. Plus, it's. You know, you need you need the life gain to make it really, really good. Although I think it's standalone fine if you have no other life gain in your deck as a more defensive <laughs> Definitely. strategy, right? It's just a two. Oh, it's it's a brick yeah. wall, yeah. Two, yeah. One and a white, three, three doesn't untap during your untap set, but whenever you gain life, you untap it. If you have enough ways to gain life, it just acts as a three, three for two mana, which is very powerful. And in the times when you don't, like you said, Kenji, you can just leave it back to block. It can do some work. I think mm -hmm. it's fine. I'm definitely taking herd collar over it, though. I agree. Herd collar is probably oh, the best no. choice right now. <laughs> Uh oh, well, no, that's muck. No, nothing like that. We got the weirdest rare that I've seen in a really long time. Like reading this card. I, 
Oh, I know what exactly what thinking? it is. Like how it it's is path of, path metal, of metal. And I'm just like, <laughs> I can actually tell you now what this card does on it. I, I actually thought I could after the GP. And then I looked it up again and I had missed even another small thing about it. All right. So here we go. <laughs> path of metal, the weirdest magic card I've ever seen printed. It is red, white for a legendary enchantment. <laughs> <laughs> when it enters a battlefield, it does one damage to each creature that doesn't have first strike, double strike, vigilance, or haste. Just this subset of cards. And then it says, whenever you attack with at least two creatures that have first strike, double strike, vigilance, and or haste, you transform it. And it becomes uh, Metzali Tower of Triumph, which is a legendary land that taps for one mana of any color. But it's got two abilities. And the, the first one is like, okay, I get it. One on a red, tap it. It does uh, two damage to each opponent. Cool. The next one is like, what? And this is actually the part I screwed up too. It's two and a white, tap. Choose a creature at random that attacked this turn. Destroy that creature. It's not, I, I actually I thought it was that. destroy target attacking creature at random, but that's not what it is. You choose a creature and that had attacked this turn. So like e is either attacking now or, you know, you can do it um, at the end step or something like that. And then it gets destroyed. I what? <laughs> what in the world is happening with this card? It's so confusing. Um, I don't think it's very good. I don't think so either. I just, it's, it's one of those what cards. I like exactly what yeah. you're, or, uh, uh, yeah was, you know <laughs> what, what, what are we doing, doing here and now i did have somebody transform it against me okay that's it, probably it was pretty very good, good. Um, you know i'm looking at it like yeah. well wait, wait a minute i only have three attackers the, the, it's not lethal if i attack you you get to just start sniping my creatures you know not the one you want necessarily but you know i want to keep all three thank you very much and uh and then on top of it if you don't then they're like cool take two you know, and, and it starts to add up very quickly. I mean, you might not think two is a lot, but this is a red white card that goes in a red white deck most of the time. And, uh, you know, you, your life total doesn't necessarily stay very high against red white aggro. And so they can finish you off pretty quickly with path of metal. So I think it's an interesting card, but I, I don't really understand. I don't think it's very good for limited. So I would just take Crested Herd Caller here. Okay, so there's our cracker packs. I'm going to put these cards um, in a little envelope thing I have. And like I said, uh, I give these away. If you're a patron, you are automatically added to the giveaway. And once that pile gets big enough, I will uh, announce who wins it and then start the next one going again. All right, can you just get into the initial impressions? We've both had our chance to uh, draft this format quite a bit. I mean, I'm, I know you've been going nonstop on your stream. I've been drafting it a lot myself as well. Um, the first thing I actually want to talk about <clears throat> before we get into any of the nitty gritty is I feel a, a sense of relief, Kenji. Uh, this doesn't, this doesn't feel like Ixalan <laughs> to me. This, this feels much better. No, it doesn't. Um, I feel like I have a little bit of flexibility in the draft. I feel like I'm not on rails, right? That I have to just draft exactly what my first two picks dictated and I don't have any wiggle room. Are you, are you experiencing that too? I agree a lot. Yeah. And you know, there, there is a lot of interaction during yep. the draft. Um, it's, it doesn't feel as bad now this could be for multiple reasons one of the reasons for me <laughs> being like i just did so poorly in triple x on standalone <laughs> but uh with rivals it, it's really i don't know it, it's felt like it's it's livened it up it's it's made things more interesting maybe the gameplay uh is still sometimes lopsided but at least during the draft you know yeah you have and, and it was interesting um covering the gp with you because it produced a lot of very exciting gameplay moments, <laughs> much more so than yes. Ixalan did. And I think the part of that is because you have this weird combination of still having some pretty linear strategies, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of curving out and combat trick and bounce spell and removal spell and then you're dead. That still can happen. But it's being combined mm -hmm. with these insane bombs, right? These bombs that can actually bring you back from having been significantly behind and not only do that, but turn the game in your favor. Like, we're not just talking about, okay, wrath the board, let's start over. I'm not losing anymore. We're talking about, you know, profane procession starts to get activated and even a good curve out may not be able to overcome it. And then on top of it, profane procession gives you the, the creatures and all of a sudden you're killing your opponent with the creatures that were killing you, right? Th same thing with like yeah. a card like Tetsamok. You know, you, 
you you think you're losing or you know you're way behind and you know the turn five they go tetsumaki or three things like mark them for death and then they're like oh no and then you untap play it and now you've got a six six they just lost their board and all of a sudden the tables have been firmly turned on them and th these are the type of things that make for really great viewing, you know, at a, at a GP and, and are really fun for us to cover. But we didn't get a lot of that in Ixalan. No, not at all. It, I mean, we had a Polyraptor going off with Forerunner <laughs> of the Empire on we did. camera. That was PV that, that was did so that. That was so cool. It was funny because we got really lucky, yeah, right? Because so. had, we, had, uh, we had Matt Nass just randomly standing next to the booth. And I'm just like, hey, Matt, what happens here? He's like... He just snapped it off too, no hesitation. He's just like, he's like, he gets seven polyraptors and does three to everything, you know? And like, because this is the type of thing that like the first time you see it, it's not really intuitive. You have to like re recognize that two polyraptors are in the battlefield at the same time at one point and triggering the other ones. And it's like, okay, wait, what's happening? You know? And once you do it, you're like, okay, I get it. Right. But you know, of course, Matt Nass just sees all this stuff. You know, he's got like this sort of <laughs> matrix view on these combos and uh, we got lucky for that. But yeah, I mean, that kind of stuff is, is something that you just wouldn't expect to see at all uh, out of Ixalan. It would be more like, oh, he played another vampire and OK, he won. You know, it's like wah wah. Uh, here we had some some really spicy stuff. OK, so I wanted to get that out of the way. The format seems much better. I'm much happier playing it. And uh, and I'm glad that uh, that uh, that that's the case, because I was a little down on Ixalan there for for quite a while um, uh, near the end of it. Um, thank God for Cube. Um, so let's talk about a couple of things that are big picture, Kenji. So the first one is when we did a set review, Luis and I, um, we were talking about Ascend, you know, and we wanted to make sure that we didn't overvalue Ascend and just assume that every card that says when you have the city's blessing is always going to have the city's blessing on it, right? It's, it's going to be common that it's not. And so as, you know, in, as competitive limited players, we need to look at these cards and we need to really say, okay, what's my average case? Like, how happy am I playing this if I never get the city's blessing? Is this a playable card? Because you don't want to have that BCSM, right? That best case scenario mentality where you're just like, well, I'll just always get the city's blessing and now I'm going to evaluate this card. That's just not how it ends up working. So, so but right. the question is, how not often do you get the city's blessing, right? Like how, you know, is does it happen more often than not? What, what has been your uh, initial take on it? I think it happens more frequently than uh, people often mm -hmm. give it credit for. Um, obviously, a lot easier to hit in sealed, in my opinion, especially since the games tend to go a little bit slower and yep. people don't have um, the more streamlined, you know, vampire, merfolk, whatever, tribal decks. Uh, that being said, you know, y you often want to run the ascend cards that are still good without ascend right. over the cards that are only good when you have ascend or at least less playable, mm -hmm. you know. Things like... Um, Sky Marcher Aspirant, the 2 1 for a white that gains flying, yep. you know, when you have Ascend. Well, that card is still fine uh -huh. by itself in this format. Like, if you want to just curve out, it's also a vampire, so it has synergies. But then later on in the game, you know, it turns into a 2 1 flyer at the very least. So I, I think there's, there's a spectrum yeah. of cards. Yeah, Storm with Ascend Swashbuckler are... comes to mind. Yep. Um, I think one that's a little bit awkward is the like Slippery Scoundrel. That's yeah. the blue and two for a 2 2. Uh, but if you have the city's blessing, it gets hexproof and unblockable. Now it is a pirate, but three mana for a two-two is often well mm -hmm. below the curve, you know, in the early game. But late game, uh, it, well, you can't deal with it because you can't target it, and it's unblockable. So if they slap like a pirate's cutlass or a Tillanali's crown on it, then right, you're just exactly dead. yeah. So that's been the interesting thing for me. The, the way I've looked at Ascend is, if left unchecked. Right. If if the player gets to kind of just do their thing, they're going to hit ascend almost every game where they get to play magic. Oh, and yeah. they're going to do it in a relatively timely fashion. You know, it's going to be turn six, turn seven. They'll probably have it. Like they don't, they only need like one thing that makes two permanents plus a normal curve out, not even like a perfect one, two, three, four, but you know, something like a two, three, five, you know, whatever. They're going to, they're going to have it. But what also happens is that this format can be very quick. And that means that people are racing or they're one of them's trying to prevent that. And, and, and if you're starting to interact by either killing opponents, creatures or trading for them, it can delay ascend significantly where you can't just consistently get it. So to me, it's a real question of 
you're either in one of two groups. You're in the first group, which is what you touched on at first, Kenji, which is I'm fine playing this card. And if I get a send shrug, awesome. That's cool. Or you're in the second group where you kind of need your, your send cards to get turned on and you're playing a deck and a strategy that is absolutely trying to do that. That is trying to gum up the ground game so that people can't uh, force trades or, or get you dead before you can get to it. And that is setting up the proper payoffs for the, when you actually get a send. Uh, or get a city's blessing, I should say, and then and then pay it off. And I think you should know when you put these cards in your deck which one you are, um, because I've seen both, and I think they can both work. It's just that if you're going to be significantly pressured in this format, which you should plan for, it doesn't happen every game, but it, it'll happen a lot of the time. Um, then look at your cards and say, well, well am I going to get the city's blessing? How often? And uh, am I going to have to start blocking? Because that was the thing that stood out to me, Kenji, like at the pre-release in the early stages, was people just wouldn't block. I'm like, attack with these three things. And my thinking is, okay, well, they're going to trade off with these two and I'll probably get in with that one, but I can accept these trades because I'm casting this other thing. And they're like, no blocks. I'm like, what? I'm like, okay, take six, I guess. And I'm like, <laughs> what is going on? And then they're like, land thing. I have the city's blessing and now my creature's better or whatever. And, you know, on to be honest with you, in the back of my head, I'm like, that was not worth taking six damage. But, you know, at the same no. time, like, you know, people are really trying to prioritize it. And, uh, you know, it's just, it turns out the payoffs for Ascent aren't so great, right? I mean, there's a couple of cards that get better uh, in a major way, but most of them are incremental, right? It's like, you know, the 2-2 two, two guy gets double strike instead of being regular. The, uh, you know, the flyer is a 2-3. Well, it turns into a 3-4. Well, that's significant, but that's not game-breaking, right? That's not like, well, now I win the game and I was losing it. You know, you give that thing lifelink or something, and now, now you're talking business, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, I think that's that's like the overall thing about Ascend is that you're going to get it frequently, but you don't want to overvalue it, you know, because cards will get better, but they're not backbreaking unless it's like a, a Twilight's Prophet, Ooh, one of the very love few that card, yeah. Ascend cards. Okay, yeah. so Ascend, you can do it, but make sure you know why and uh, you'll you'll benefit from it and don't assume you're going to get it because sometimes people are going to force you to, uh, to trade off your permanents and... Also, of course, you know, when you right. mulligan to five or whatever, your chances of getting to ascend go down a lot. Um, yeah. Aggro's been winning for me, Kenji. Uh, the, the, uh, I mean, the format was very aggressive in Ixalan, and I wanted to see if it would carry over here, and uh, I think it has. Um, the thing that we noticed while doing the set review was that there was a lot of two-mana creatures. Well, okay, there's two things. There's a lot of one-mana creatures that were pretty playable and part of a curve-out. And there's a lot of two mana creatures that are evasive. And I actually compared it to original Zendikar where you had these kind of, it felt like each color had its two drop that was, you know, we, we joke, you know, hyperbolically called it unblockable, but you know, just where it heavily disincentivized you from blocking, you know, there was one that had menace with landfall. There was the two one flyer that couldn't, you know, the welcome turn. There was the uh, plated mm -hmm. geopede, which you could never block. And, you know, these guys, th these type of cards lent to turn twos that were like, well, you're not blocking for a little while. And here you have that same exact stuff again. And it turns out that those are good foundations for aggressive decks. One of the cards that I bet you anything, if I looked right now, it would be my most drafted card in the format is Goblin Trailblazer. <laughs> yeah, that's that's probably yeah. right up there for me like as well. That, that card to me is awesome. It's the one in a red two one with menace and it's also a pirate. I mean... That that type of card, and then and then the one you mentioned earlier, the uh, kite sail corsair, the one in a blue for a two one, and it has flying as long as it's attacking. Those cards just mm -hmm. pile on damage. And you know, I played a draft last night over at Adams, and I went uh, turn two uh, trailblazer, and he went turn two corsair, and we just laughed because it's like <laughs> two ships passing in the night, right? <laughs> really, there's no blocking ever happening in this game between these two cards, right? So, you know, that to me does say that, yes, this is actually a pretty aggressive format still. Agreed, agreed. And that's why curving out and even being just on the play is so huge, I think, in, uh, uh, in overall win percentage. I wouldn't be surprised if going first has like a 5% um, It feels like it, doesn't it? Drawing. Yeah, God, that's a great sure. point. I didn't even think about that. But this is uh, partly evident because of these twos. And again, I mentioned it before, but there's actually a lot of playable one drops. They've really kind of seemed to make a, a fundamental shift in R&D towards making these one drops more viable because, you know, go back two or three years and they were garbage. Like 
people would get all excited about yeah. a one, one flyer for one that, that, that had like some ability. And it was like, we had to talk them <laughs> off the ledge and say, dude, no, that is not a good card. Like that is not on average, give you a card worth of value. And now like we're pretty routinely playing, you know, daring buccaneer fanatical firebrand, um, the, the, uh, mist miscloaked Herald that you mentioned earlier in blue, um, <clears throat> You can play, although I'm not a huge fan of this one, the Jade Bearer. You know, I think it's just oh, okay. Right. Like, <laughs> I, I think if you're if you have a ton of Merfolk or whatever, you could probably justify it. But like, uh, you know, it's pr- still pretty low impact. But still, it, I, I do count it as a playable one drop. You know, in the set, and then you know what, what, the uh, the guy that we opened, the Grasping Scoundrel. Like, that's a lot of cards that aren't great, but that you often will see turn one, and you're like, well, crap. I'm on the draw and I'm not playing anything until like, let's say you just have a slow draw. You're not playing anything until turn three. You're way behind. You took six from that thing, you know? Oh yeah. That's, that's, that's a one drop that dealt six. And if they played a two drop yeah. after that, and, and now you get into the classic aggro territory, right? Because let's say I play a grasping sound draw on one and I play a goblin trailblazer on two. Okay. You're look and you're on the draw. You're looking at it like, well, crap. Right. So you play something that ostensibly can block like something. Well, now a removal spell is four damage hitting you. Right. A bounce spell is four Mm -hmm. damage hitting you. A combat trick is uh, a couple of damage and you losing your creature. And this is where it gets really tight, really fast. And this is where cards like what you mentioned with the slippery scoundrel, these type of cards where you're looking at that and you look down at a card that says ascend. When you have 10 or more, you're like, what? Like, I, I don't care about a sin. I need this thing to block now, right? Because I'm going to die. Yes. And th- and then you end up trading your two or three right. drop to their one drop. And, and you're they still have a so far behind because yeah. then they get to play. And, and that yeah. happens in this format. Now, it doesn't mean that it's the only thing that happens in this format. But these cards are playable. They're viable. And you will see them. So if you're completely unprepared for this or if you're woefully optimistic about getting to a send or getting to your eight drop or whatever, these these kind of decks will simply run you over. So that is something to keep yes. in mind. Now. We're going to talk about a specific format or a specific archetype that you and I have been exploring when it comes to slowing things down in a little bit. But in general, have you found control decks or, you know, what have you found to, to be able to combat these uh, these potential quick quick starts from the, the aggro decks? Uh, just like the one drop creatures that, you know, used to be unplayable, but now everybody is basically playing. You need to start playing the removal spells that... Uh, upon initial inspection, aren't very good, but are actually very good in the format. So things like Shake the Foundations or oh, Dual Shot from dual regular Ixalan. That card is... Yeah, that, I think you always main deck the first Dual Shot in this format now because it's just yeah. so often a two-for-one. Yeah, two for my, one. my opponent in the draft so. last night played Kite Sail Corsair and... Um, oh, what is that stupid card called? Uh, War Kite Marauder. Oh, yeah, the, the, the rare. Shot. That one's great. I was like, oh yeah, my and, god, like, this is the sickest feeling ever. One mana killed those two things? Exactly. And so Dual Shot, you know, was sideboard fodder in Triple Ixalan. And so you look at something like Shake the Foundations that deals one damage to all creatures without flying. You're like, well, this is this is probably another card that's going to be relegated to the sideboard. But no, I think you start main decking these as a way to combat not only the aggressive decks, but also just have like potential blowout if you're also on a deck that might not... Uh, fare very well against it. I was talking to you earlier, like I had a deck with five or six Goblin Trailblazers and I was still running the Shake the Foundation. Yeah, I remember I I asked you because you you, you told me really early on, in fact, this is like on Friday before the GP, I really like Shake the Foundations. And I I admit, I still kind of had it in the, yeah, you know, maybe if you have an Enraged deck. That that was my thing. I was thinking, okay, (laughs) I could definitely see this in an Enraged Dinosaurs deck where you can get a bunch of value. You get the card back anyway and maybe kill some, you know, a Merfolk or a couple of vampires or whatever and then you're like no no i like main deck and i think it's really good and i'm like well how many goblin trailblazers you run you're like five i'm like what (laughs) okay well i guess he really likes it Uh, either that or kenji's just crazy but they also might both be true um okay let's go over quickly the um just sort of give an update on the major archetypes that we knew from that were being carried over from ixalan to rivals um, which were, uh, mm-hmm. so I'll start with, uh, white, black vampires. Uh, so is white, black vampires still going strong? Is it still a thing? What's your take on it? 
Uh, it might be the mm. best mm -hmm. aggro deck in the format, just because it can race with like black red pirates. It can race um, with any other color combination. But the fact is, you have a lot of incidental life gain oh, yeah. with the vampires, and so that just makes it so much easier yeah, for that, you to that race. That is something ahead. that you see a lot. Those little 1-1 one, one lifelinking vampires, they help you double block menace creatures. They help you chip in for damage or trade with those one drops that we were just talking about. Uh, and man, they do a really good job. They really do of, uh, of just incrementally getting back that life and that card advantage. Um, what about blue green merfolk? Yeah. Still very, very much a thing. Mm -hmm. Just like white black vampires, they have a lord, so merfolk good. mistbinder. Uh, they also get access to a lot more bounce. Um, and just a really good curve. But the, the thing about the Merfolk is it's harder to come back from behind um, if if you fall behind with their deck. Like you, The Merfolk deck wants to be slamming in and bouncing the opponent's creatures, and if you fall behind at yeah, all, it's just it, so it, hard you, to pull back. Uh, right, and what you'll see is that you don't have great blockers. You'll be forced to use your bounce spells uh, reactively. Yeah, and even though yeah. you think, okay, I'm doing stuff and whatever... Fast forward three turns and you're always behind because they just recast the card and you're yep. still in the same situation, but you're the one who's down a card. If you can bounce their creature to get in for a bunch of damage and set up lethal the next turn, you're getting a lot of value out of your bounce spell. But if you're doing it just to stay alive, that is not a winning combination. You will fall behind. Um, all right. Now, for pirates, you know, the in, in Ixalan, it, I don't think any one like – uh, of the color pairs, there's three different color pairs for the pirates. You could either be uh, blue, red, blue, black, or black, red. I don't think any one of them stood out. Like, did did one of them stand out to you? It's like, well, this is what you want to be doing in this format. I kind of saw like reasonable versions of each color. Um, maybe blue, black was the one I saw the most. What was your take on that? From mm -hmm. yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. I think blue, black was the most uh, played was never in like triple great, Ixalan, right? but now with rivals. No, no. It, yeah, I mean, they I were all so pretty too. comparable, I think. But uh, with triple rivals, I think blue black is now the yes. worst of the color yes. combinations. Black red's for the, the best. <laughs> okay, I think so. And then blue red Agreed. is probably very close behind to second. I mean, it might be it might be equal, but blue blue red and uh, yeah, red both black of them both also, by good. the way, powered by their gold uncommons. Uh, and I think the the nod goes to the black red one because I think it's uncommon. It's just slightly better, which is dire fleet neckbreaker. That's the two black red three two. Uh, pirate and it says attacking pirates you control get plus two plus oh that thing's overperformed for me mm -hmm. um you can just leave it sitting there as a sort of like an enchantment if it can't attack and it just turns all those pesky little uh pirates into major threats but uh that being said the uh the uncommon Stormfleet Sprinter for the blue-red version, one blue-red for a 2-2 haste unblockable pirate, is also very strong. A really nice curve, uh, you know, curve spot there at three to start slamming in. And as we've mentioned before, there's a lot of ways to augment these creatures. It's not just a 2-2 for three that gets to keep attacking every turn. It's also, you know, it carries uh, any type of equipment well. You can even use... Uh, Buccaneers bravado in it to get in for six damage that they can't really interact with or God forbid combine it with Till and Ollie's crown or something and, and just kill them. You know, there's a lot of ways that you can just <laughs> kill people out of nowhere and Stormfleet Sprinter is one of the ways it kind of enables that. Definitely, yeah. I think the blue-red deck is more about the surprise, mm -hmm. oh, I got you for 10 damage, whereas the red-black is a little yes. bit more about the removal. And yeah, going uh, and, wide and, going and then, wide. you know, hopefully finishing up with uh, the neckbreaker or something similar. Um both of them, though, again, and, and, and you know, I, I know I mentioned this a couple of times already, but I'm really high on this card. It, it, again, Goblin Trailblazer is sort of the crux between those two decks. So you want as many of those as you can get in both copies of that deck. They're, it's, it's excellent in both of them. Um, and then that yes. leaves us with the tribe that really didn't fare that well in Ixalan overall, Dinosaurs. Um, you know, some combination of red, white, and or green um, you know, in there for those, how have you found them? They got some nice tools here, uh, in, um, in rivals. Yeah. I think white for the most part has fallen by the wayside and the red green dinos, if you're going to build mm. dinos is where you want to be. Uh, it has a lot of access to nice tools. Now, a lot of the uncommons are super powerful. We were talking yes. about forerunner really of the Empire good. a little bit. And that card is just superstar. I, I think forerunner of the empire is a very first pickable uh, uncommon that's three mm -hmm. and a red for a one three. 
Uh, it's one of the forerunners, so when it enters the battlefield, you get to tutor up for a vampire, or rather a, a dino and put it on top of your library. But then whenever a dino enters the battlefield under your control, it deals one damage to all creatures. And we were talking about dual shot and shake the foundation and how many one toughness creatures there are in this format. Well, that thing is great versus them. Plus, you can play, you know, multiple dinosaurs a yeah. turn to kind of pyroclasm or uh, sweltering suns type of Yeah, I didn't realize more damage everything. When I, I, so when I saw that, I thought it was going to be the worst of them. And my reasoning was that it's expensive at four mana. It's not a dinosaur itself. It's a human. So, like, it doesn't synergize. And then yeah. I thought that the the uh, one damage to everything was kind of a throw-in for, like, getting some random enrage triggers. And that maybe you'd, again, snipe mm-hmm. something small occasionally. It turns out that's not the case. Like, you... You are getting that pyroclasm effect of two damage to everything. You know, if you cast a crested herd collar that you went and searched up off of it, you're getting one damage to everything, which kills. That's right. Goblin Trailblazer, the Kite kite Sail Corsair, right? These cards that we've been talking about that are kind of the linchpin at the two drop slot at common. It kills all of those. And that's huge. And all of a sudden, now I think that Empire might be the best of the Forerunners, even though when I first saw it, I thought I had it at the worst. So... Yeah, I, th- I think it's definitely up there for the best. Mm. And it's it's a May ability, too. So if you have nothing, or if you're, you're the only one with creatures, you don't have to kill your own creatures. Uh, God forbid you <laughs> with a needle tooth raptor. Whenever you play a dino, you just get to shoot it's something for absurd, six, basically. absurd, by the way, that combo. Like, yeah. there's so many decks that just fold to it. They're just like, well, can't win. Oh, yeah. You know? um, I love that one. <laughs> okay, uh, so you like red-green for the dinos there. So that's how those have carried over. Now, this gets kind of interesting, Kenji. There were two color pairs that were ruthlessly ignored in uh, Ixalan. There was green, black, and blue, white. <laughs> now, they got a couple of cards around there that were like little hints. But the key thing is that they didn't get any gold on commons in Ixalan. They were just left out of that fun. And those can often be the difference between a really great version of an archetype and not. And so it was a little weird. And those two color pairs, at least for me, didn't end up being very good. Right. Like I wasn't ever really happy with green, black, and I viewed blue, white as a type of deck that if I had really good cards, I was happy with it, but that it didn't have a lot of inherent synergies built into it. Like some of the other, like a vampire's deck did or a merfolk deck. Yeah. And now we agree. Yep. Hey, threw him a bone. They actually did get a gold uncommon for each. So just as a reminder, blue, white got resplendent Griffin, which is one white blue for a two, two flying. It's got to send. If you have the city's blessing, when it attacks, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. And then the uh, jungle creeper in green, black is one green, black for a three, three, which I like. It's an elemental. So n- not relevant creature type, but you can pay five mana, three green, black to return it from your graveyard to your hand. Slow. It's a slow card as far as that ability goes. But a three mana three three is pretty good as well and maybe has some graveyard synergies. Uh, do you have any sense for, for these color pairs? Um, are they real now or are they still kind of on the, on the sidelines? Green black is, is probably more on the sideways, uh, sidelines than blue white. Green black is more kind of just good stuff thrown together. Like you mentioned jungle creeper, but that's, that's still more yeah. filler than anything else. It's, it's weird because the green black payoffs yeah. are all in the last pack. You know, you get, uh, things like wild growth walker and other explore, uh, synergies, but you get two packs of rivals. And so it's just kind of hard to build upon that. So what you generally end up doing is, you know, you're seeing a lot of good green and black cards going around like impales or swift wardens or stuff like that. You end up taking them uh, and going into pack three, you just have a pile of good green, black stuff. And then you hope to get, you know, something, something that synergizes well with that in the last pack. Uh, I mean, luckiest thing, obviously sure. being Vraska, of course, but you, you yeah, have a lot but, of nice you know, commons and uncommons. But it's weird because like uh, in the you talk pack. about explore, but there's like no explore cards in rivals. Yeah. And that's that's the problem. If it, if it was reversed, sure, it would make a lot more sense. But because you have two packs of very like, few explore do, do you cards, know, I'm gonna quiz the, the payoffs you. Do you know are how much many worse. non-rare explore cards there are in rivals? Yes, a non-rare explore cards. Yeah, uh, J Light Rangers are rare. Let's see. Uh, I'm gonna say like two, There's but I don't even one. know what they are off the top of my head. It's Enter the Unknown. Okay, it doesn't it? even have Explore itself. Oh, yeah. Yeah, common, it's There's zero common or uncommon Explore uh, creatures. No. And just for those of you who uh, completionists out there, Jade Light Ranger, 
Path of Discovery, which again doesn't actually have it itself, but but would be good. Oh with, yeah, that's good. Uh, you know any of those uh, payoffs, and then Tom B. Robber. Yeah, the rare. So, oh, yeah, um, the rare. so yeah, like, so even your payoffs when you get to that are like, oh, good. I got a wild growth walker. I hope I get a lot of explore out of this pack. Right. So yeah, it's not super well supported, but I definitely agree with what you said about it being a pile of good cards. And it kind of is, uh, you know, like you said, you're like, oh, hey, a swift ward and that's pretty good. And you pick up some decent, uh, creatures in there and then you're like impale. That's nice. You know, moment of, uh, craving. Yeah. Like, okay, I got one of those and craving, you yeah. know, you, you pick up a couple of those each and, Eh, you know, you can make a deck full of creatures and removal and some tricks and just kind of have just a normal whatever deck, but it's not paying you off, right? There's no, even the jungle creeper, as you said, ends up being, feels a little closer to filler because it's very vanilla. It's a three, three for three, but that's it. And then when it dies, yeah, sure. You can pay eight mana to eventually get it back on the battlefield again, but what, is that exciting? Not really. It's fine, but it's not exciting. It's not, you know, Oh wow, I have, you know, three vampires and now you're dead or whatever. So, yeah, th these ones aren't aren't really being paid off in a in a big way. What about blue white? What do you what 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 do you see as the baseline strategy for that? I actually like blue white. Mm -hmm. You got a ton of flyers now. Um I mean, more than more than what you had before. Previously in Triple X line, oh, yeah. you were playing things yep. like Raptor Companion and Bishop Soldier for your two drop slot. And while Bishop Sol Soldier is still amazing, don't get me wrong, now you get access to like that Kite Sail Corsair. Um, in addition to some other flyers. So I, th I think blue-white is definitely a thing. It's just, it's still not a thing thing, if that makes any sense, right? You can you can draft the flyers, and there is some support with it, uh, but it's just not, I don't think, the. Not, I'm not going to say correct, but Opt optimal the flyer going to end up. It, yeah, yeah, it's just sometimes, oh, hey, look, I'm getting a lot of blue-white cards, and they all have some sort of evasion. I guess this is a deck, you know. Okay. All right. So we've covered uh, most of the major strategies here. Um, I, I mentioned that Black Rite Pirates, uh, Aggro Pirates is my favorite. Do, do you have a favorite? Uh, do you have a deck that you're like happiest with right now? I think now? Blue Red or Blue Black. Sorry, uh, Blue Red or uh, Red Black are, are definitely my two go-to strategies for okay. aggressiveness. Yeah. We're pi both pirates. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's talk about some of the overperformers and un underperformers in the set, Kenji. So I'm going to throw a bunch of these out that I came up with and, and you did as well. And then we'll talk about uh, what we think about each one uh, kind of briefly. So let's so start with the overperformers. Um, one of them mm -hmm. is mutiny. Um, you know, I, again, I, these are adjustments that we make, right? We it's rare that we'll do the set review or, you know, look at a set or, or draft it a couple of times and just be completely off on a card, right? It's, it's, it, that doesn't happen very often. What does happen though is you make adjustments, right? So mutiny, I thought this could be pretty good and it's even a little better. Basically, it just kills something relevant. Now, it doesn't necessarily kill the thing you want to kill, which isn't great, but you're spending one mana. And when you're trying to get your opponent dead with menace creatures and stuff like that, killing one thing for one mana is kind of exactly what you want in that curve out early part of the game. And, and I, I found Mutiny to be pretty good. Yeah, so the thing is, because your curve is generally going to be slanted uh, to the cheaper, cheaper end and you're going to have uh, aggressive starts a lot of times, using one mana to deal with a 2-2 two -two or a 3-3 three -three, or, you know, just a creature with two toughness, three toughness is very, very good. Like... You would play that card if it just said red, sorcery, deal two damage to a creature, deal three damage to a creature, you know, one or the other. That's still very good. Yeah. Totally. Very good. Yeah. And that is what it plays like yep. a lot, right? Again, you, you, you can't be too greedy, you know, thinking, oh, I want to kill, I wanted to kill the other creature. It's like, it's one <laughs> mana, dude. Uh, Legion Conquistador has been pretty good. Um, you know, it, it ended up being pretty good in Ixalan as well. And I think it's carried over nicely. It's, you know, you can get them in all three packs. And every time somebody plays it against my deck, I'm like, oh, that's it really is, annoying. It is for sure. Uh, like, I didn't like it as much in Triple Ixalan, both rivals. You know, you have a lot more of the synergy vampire based cards, but also, Two twos just end up trading with a lot of creatures in the format if the game goes a little bit longer. Now, obviously, three mana for a two two isn't a great rate, but if you get you know three or more, then well, you're just up on card advantage. Right, and 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 that does matter, and it does affect the board in a yeah. timely fashion enough that having ex expendable blockers can be really good. Um, you know, one card that I've actually liked a little more than I thought as well is uh, Sanguine mm -hmm. Glorifier. 
That's the three and a white, three, three vampire. And you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on another target vampire you control. I don't know. I, I think I just viewed that as more of like a filler four drop, you know, oh, it's a, it's a hill giant with some upside, whatever. But it turns out, you know, the fact that it's a plus one, plus one counter on one of your other vampires when you're playing a vampire deck. I found that counter to be quite valuable. Uh, you know, it goes on something with lifelink or evasion or whatever. And, uh, more than I thought, uh, I, again, I, I normally would view this card as, as borderline filler. Um, you know, s- somewhere along the line, say of the, uh, the merfolk equivalent, the jadecraft yep. artisan, which I actually think is also a, a pretty decent card, but you know, I think that sanguine glorifier, I, I would bump it up half a notch. Uh, from yeah. It just makes combat before. that much harder for the opponents. Yeah. Yeah. So I like that one. And, and I like that it leaves a permanent, uh, thing, you know, you're adding four power to the battlefield I, for four mana in a relevant tribe. That's pretty good. Um, oh man, this next one's all you, buddy. Golden demise. Ha. <sighs> yeah. You were high on this card from the moment we arrived in, uh, in Indy and I tried it out based on your recommendation. And now it's just skyrocketed to the top of yeah, my I, list I as well. I first picked this over most uh rares honestly it, i think that card is that good same like even if you don't have the city's blessing you know giving minus two to minus minus two minus two to everything is is so potent and then should you have the city's blessing and you're only giving minus two minus two to your opponent's creatures well that makes attacking with your creatures that much better you know or it just turns it into a, like a one-sided plague wind almost well, i guess that's that that is plague right. wind, isn't it <laughs> just, just a plague wind yeah yeah, it turns into a plague win in this type of format. And man, you can just lure those aggro uh-huh, yeah. decks with their stupid one drops in and just play it on three and you can get a three for one. Like if they have the the one drop, two drop, three drop, everything yes. dies to this yes. in those decks. So yes, Golden Demise, probably the best uncommon in the set. So don't don't sleep on that card. It is fantastic uh in this Ooh, type better of better than Chupacabra? Um I, I think it I think be. it's close, but I, I honestly do. I honestly do think it might be. I don't know. Like, uh, there's probably a list of say three to four uncommons that I would put in like the yeah. top tier. Um, you know, and I need to play a little more before I know exactly what those are. But like, I know that those two Agreed. cards are in. It, I agree. You know, and I'm sure that they're not in the same print run. Like, <laughs> I, I don't think you would ever have to choose between the two. Um, next one card that we knew was excellent and is somehow even maybe a little better is moment of craving uh a- against these these uh low to the ground aggro decks killing something for just two mana uh killing something relevant and then even the life gain tacked on for getting an extra two life uh and all of this at instant speed is just super good it just is great and now i think i might be taking it over and pale. yeah i've done that uh quite a fair amount especially if i already have one in pale i think the moment of craving is just that good like it kills everything early on two life is sometimes even another turn also it's just good mid combat as well to kind of ambush a bigger creature since it's it's speed i really like moment of craving yeah that's what i think too because i think about it like this okay Let's just say that I could switch out Moment of Craving for Impale at any point. I can just the my my draft pick is is either or, right? So if my opponent is doing, you know, if if they go um grasping scoundrel, right? I do not want impale. Like it's so much slower. You know, I mean obviously I want it, but I'm saying between the two, I want moment of craving so that I can kill whatever their two drop is or whatever. Okay, so that that's easy. Um and then I think, okay, what about the middle part of the game? You know, I look at it, and in many scenarios, the moment of craving does the same job that Impale does. It just has to do it in combat, right? You just have to be like, block, and they're like, okay, uh, pass priority, and you're like, okay, shrink your guy, eat it. So, and you know, and it's not quite as consistent, but you can, you know, uh, generate, you can still take down something, a 4-4 or 5-5, even if you don't have a great board um, using moment of craving. Now, in the later part of the game, Impale wins that fight, right? When they play their their mythic, rare or their big dragon or, or excuse me a big dinosaur <laughs> or whatever you'd rather have an impale and so it does win that fight and i think it makes it close between the two but i'll tell you what kenji where i'm kind of at on it is i'd rather have my first moment of craving than my first impale maybe the second time that decision comes around if i took moment of craving i might take the impale the second time but i just i don't want to get ran over you know these these decks are so fast if i place a a merfolk deck right and they play merfolk mistbinder i want to be able to like, kill it yeah. as soon as possible and you know, exactly. mom, another thing um, about Moment of Craving is that it's it's good mm-hmm. 
not just turn two. It's good all throughout the middle game as well, because there are plenty of like four or five drops that, that are relevant that you can kill. Things like we were talking about Needle Tooth Raptor or Dead Eye Rig Haulers, things like, you know, these are creatures that Moment of Craving still deals with that are very potent and uh, come down later in the game. So Yes, absolutely. Um, Buccaneers Bravado, we talked about it a while ago, but, you know, it looked like one of those potentially scary cards. <laughs> yep, it is. <laughs> it just wins yeah, the game I sometimes. always want at least one in my Pirates decks. Um, and, you know, combine it with Tildenali's Crown, which I have done plenty of times. It is just so much damage out of nowhere, only for four mana. It's... It's yeah, backbreaking. But- Plus, it's just a great combat trick because we were talking about uh, all the menace creatures. Well, you slap this on a goblin trailblazer after they double blocked it, and oh my, that's still a great deal. Yeah. So don't sleep on that one. And for the love of all things, remember it <laughs> when your opponent goes attack with everything and you think, well, I'll just let this 3 3 through, and you're sitting at 8 life. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you have to play around Buccaneers Bravada. We even saw. Um, somebody went on camera with it, right? Where they needed to top deck it and boom, they did. Um, we already mentioned this one, but needle tooth Raptor, um, especially with four, one of the empire has really overperformed needle tooth Raptor is just a hard card to attack Mm -hmm. into. Uh, and if you have any way to trigger it, it, it starts mowing down their biggest threats. Very, if you get a one for one with needle tooth Raptor, then you're happy. Yeah, exactly. And it feels like you always get better than that. Um, what about Squire's Devotion? I think that's just another very impressive card, especially in this uh, racing format. Like, it, it not only gives you two towards the City's Blessing, right? It gives you the enchantment, the Squire's Devotion itself, but it also produces a 1-1 one, one lifelinking vampire, which oh, is, yeah. which is mm-hmm. really relevant as, well, 1-1 one, one lifelinker is just good in this format to begin with. But uh, you, you think of Mark of the Vampire, which is one of the the most back-breaking cards in Triple Ixalan, right? And that was four mana plus two plus two lifelink. Well, three mana plus one plus one lifelink is still just as good. And uh, I think Squire's Devotion is... And getting a one Yeah, I think think Squire's Devotion is way up there. Yeah, I I have been running that pretty happily as well. I think it's strong. Um, We talked about Kite Sail Corsair. That card's just excellent. Just awesome two-drop, pirate. Not, Not much more you could want. Right, and then you mentioned it earlier, but you love Shake the Foundations. That's definitely been an over shake, 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 as well. Shake, 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 shake your foundations. Uh, underperformers. So we don't have as many of these, but there was certainly a few. Um, impale, right? Uh, again, this is an adjustment, right? Like in order to be great at limited and frankly to, to be really good at most things in life, you need to have a yeah. gradient. You need to be able to make adjustments to the way that you view or rate things that isn't it is good or it is bad. Um, this is this comes into play with human beings. It comes into play with financial stuff, with uh, choices you need to make. And you need to be able to adjust as things change in your life and, and as decisions are put in front of you to be able to say, I used to think this thing was great. Now I think it's good. Rather than assume, and and you also need to be able to listen to other people tell you that. And that is a skill that I see a lot of, you know, grown adults don't, (laughs) that they miss on, right? They, they hear me say, well, I think, uh, Impale has underperformed a little bit. And then they will translate that as Marshall thinks Impale's bad. (laughs) You're right. And it's like that's that you need to be able to have those levels of gradiency. And I'm taking Impale down about half a notch, right? I thought, okay, it's probably the default best removal spell in the format. And it's a little slow. I mean, a lot of magic players, and I'm included, we we always say, oh, it's unplayable or it's great, you know? And so it, yeah, it's, it's so much better to, to take things on a scale. And just, just like with your guys' set reviews and whatnot, you know, it goes up by like 0.51, et cetera, et cetera. It's not just unplayable or unbeatable. Yeah, you're you're totally right to bring that up because the way that magic players communicate is hyperbolic by nature. And I'll do it too. I fall for that occasionally. I try not to, but you know, sometimes you just say it's garbage or it's unplayable. And it's 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 a magic player's way of making a point, but it's doing so a little little yep. heavy-handed, you know. And and on the show we try to, you know, make sure that we're giving you accurate information rather than than just trying to sound like we're spouting off. Um next one Majestic Helioptrus. You know, it looked like it might have some potential. Oh, it's been well, pretty bad. Four mana for a 2-2. Two, two. It better be Needletooth <laughs> yeah. Raptor. It better better be Needletooth Raptor, Marshall. 
<laughs> they play the forerunner of the empire. I'll search up this four mana majestic Heliot. You're like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, yes, it has a powerful ability whenever it attacks another target dinosaur you control gains flying until the turn. It could pick up some six, six and kill your opponent. But this format's way too fast for you to take a whole turn off to cast this four mana two, two flying. And the truth is, is that the cre- the big creatures down on the ground, they often have, they often are the best attackers oh, yeah. there if anyway. You, if you have Colossal Dreadmaw like that. already, that's going to be the biggest thing right. there. It's like, come right. on. Yeah, if people are playing, you know, the Grasping Scoundrel and you have a, a Colossal Dreadmaw on the battlefield, you, you don't need to, to you know, play a really <laughs> underpowered card to, to give it Also, fun. just just think about um, Aerial Guide from Amonkhet. Just just remember Aerial Guide when you think of Majestic Yes, the yes, yes, do that. Um Strength of the pack? Yeah, I think this card I thought was very good uh, at the beginning of the format. Wh- which one is it? That's the 4GG? Yeah, all your creatures get plus 2, plus 2. Uh, pl- two, counter- two plus counters. 1, plus 1 counters, yeah. Um, yeah, sorcery speed. I, like, in the beginning of the format, my one of my opponents had gone like 1 drop, 2 drop, 3 drop, 4 drop, bounce spell into strength of the pack, and I lost. But as time has progressed, you know, that, that was obviously like best case scenario for this card. Very rarely do games right. go to a super board stall. Uh, to where you have enough creatures to where you're going to want this to be good, right? During during uh, the GP coverage, we saw somebody cast Strength of the Pack to give one creature their Exali's Diviner plus two plus two, and it was just to, like, survive. So yeah, I, I think this card I've had is, that yeah. s- situation a lot, too. Yeah, you know, the, the dream that you, you think that you're going to live is that you'll curve out into it or that you'll have a board stall where both players are kind of staring at each other with no great attacks and you're going to go strength of the pack attack with everything and just put your opponent in a horrendous situation. And while those do exist, they are relatively rare. And all you need to do is go back to our discussion a little earlier about the aggro decks in the format. And you think about holding strength of the pack when your opponent has goblin trailblazers and kite sail corsairs and, you know, fanatical firebrands and grasping scoundrels and stuff like that. They don't care that your creatures are bigger. They're looking to kill you. They're not looking to interact with your creatures. And that's the thing that you have to really grasp here, right? A card like Goblin Trailblazer is great because it does not interact with your opponent's creatures. It does not care what your opponent's creatures are because as long as it can stay one step ahead, it doesn't get blocked. Same thing with Kite Sail Corsair. That's a, you know, 2-1 flying for 2 mana effectively. The reason why it's good is because it's not interacting. And if you have a 2020 down on the ground, it just flies right over <laughs> it. And it's going to, and, it, and these are very proactive cards that are very bad on defense. So they're going to be incentivized to build their deck and play it in a way that gets you dead quickly. And that makes that, that, you know, the scenario where you do run into to those type of decks, it makes cards like Strength of the Pack very weak. Um, because the best case scenario for them in most, uh, situations is that you've got a couple of creatures left that you didn't trade off when you possibly could, and then you don't get to kill your opponent right away anyway because it's not like overwhelmingly great. Mm-hmm. So keep that in mind. I, I agree. Um, another one that I, I we didn't actually have it pegged as like a bomb either, but it's been really pretty mediocre is Hwatli Radiant Champion. That's two green white for a three loyalty planeswalker. Plus one, put a loyalty counter on Hwatli for each creature you control. Minus one, target creature gets plus X plus X until in a turn where X is the number of creatures you control. And then her ultimate is minus eight. You get an emblem with whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, draw a card. Card has been pretty mediocre. It just doesn't really have a big effect on the no, game. No, I completely agree. The the other Hwatli is so much better just as a zero, make a 3-3 three, three trampling dinosaur. This one doesn't have totally. that continuous effect that's going to add advantage, right? If you're behind, it doesn't do anything. Yeah, I was watching in the draft at Adams last night. My friend Matt was playing. And, you know... Uh, uh, our, our friend Michael played Hwatli and Matt was in a situation where both players had uh, like two power on the battlefield and they were racing. They were at like 12 to 11 and he thought for a minute and he's just like, I'm just going to attack yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, like, I'm just going to ignore, like, what are you going to do with Hwatli that kills me? Like you have one creature, right? And sure enough, uh, the best that, that, uh, that Michael could do was ultimate Hwatli and then hope to draw a bunch of creatures in a row, which he unfortunately didn't for him, but, you know, w- which seemed fine. I mean, I think that was the correct line to take. He just ended up drawing a few extra lands. But, you know, that's like your best case scenario with Hwatli, and that's not that great. Again, cards that benefit you for having a well-built-out board don't seem to be good here because the game ends quickly and you're incentivized to trade in many scenarios, and uh, that's where these type of cards dip off a yep, little yep. bit. Um, two more things to talk about before we call it a show here, Kenji. Uh, the first one, actually, I wanted to um, 
talk about the busted rares because everybody's been talking about them and they're completely correct. Uh, th- this set is right up there with uh, Fate Reforged as far as busted rares go. And I've got, give me just like a, a couple of word impression on each of these cards that I just randomly grabbed. So first one, Tetsamok. Broken. Broken. Uh, Hadana's Climb. Uh, impossible to race. That's right. Uh, profane Procession. Stupid good. <laughs> <laughs> Twilight Prophet, I love Twilight that Prophet one. is also just very good as a four mana like two four flyer, right? You would play that in a heartbeat in yeah. all situations and all limited formats. But the the reverse Bob, as I like to say, if you have the city's mm-hmm. blessing, oh, every turn that that sits on the battlefield is like ninety percent that you're going to lose. An additional ninety yeah, percent. Like, I don't I like- know. Yeah, whatever I'm trying to say. Yeah, no, it, it it puts you so, so far ahead. You don't even have to do anything for the rest right. of the game. you just sit there. <laughs> you just sit there, yeah. And like I said, uh, I told you this before, but Bob in reverse is also Bob. Um, Itali? Uh, another, is Itali on this level? I think so. You know, six mana, six, six, you think a colossal dread mob. But that, again, in this format is the biggest thing on the battlefield. Now, when I first read Itali, I didn't realize it was both players. Me yeah, too. So, yeah, until I actually turned it sideways. Yeah, so you get to take a card from both players' libraries on top of both players' libraries uh, and cast them immediately if it's a, a non-land. So I think Atali is definitely up there. I think that's something that, again, every turn that it sits on the battlefield is another turn that you're just pulling way far ahead. Uh, Rekindling Phoenix. Just another very, very good card. Now, there are ways to combat it, of course, the enchantment removal being the, uh, the most obvious, but uh, Rekindling Phoenix mm-hmm. is just... You know, very solid power and toughness, very hard to kill in combat or with damage base removal. Uh, another another yeah. great card. Uh, Galta. I think Galta is also Oof. amazing. I think people underestimate how easily it is to cast Galta on, say, turn five or six in this format. Yeah, uh, happens all the time. 12-12 Trampler. Yeah, that's going to end the game quick. Yeah, I mentioned uh, in the set review that you could cast Galta on turn four. Uh, obviously, difficult to do but you, that you can it, using no rares you know other than galta itself uh and of course uh luis just skewered me for it to say no you're never going to do anything you know, <laughs> i was like dude i was just whatever anyway and then we had a bunch of people send us screenshots of galta on yeah I, I did <laughs> yeah. it the other day uh, on stream i i went uh, well not turn four but i went turn six mm-hmm. attack with my miscloaked herald play dead eye rig hauler bounce uh what did oh, what did they play they, they played elemental bounce your elemental play galta turn oh six my God. <laughs> that's disgusting <laughs> you did all that stuff on turn six it was absurd oh my god yeah and of course the fact that galta has trample is sort yes. of the deal yep. breaker uh what about jade light ranger is this on the level for oh, you no not not at all i think it's just a good card but i, I don't think it's busted Okay, uh, Tender Shoot Dryad, let me re- bring you right back into the busted bomb. That's definitely busted. Uh, by the time you cast it, you have already, <laughs> what, at minimum six permanents, right? You have five lands and the Tender Shoot Dryad itself, so you're so close to hitting the Sidious Blessing already. Now remember, this is each upkeep, not just yours. Yes. It is verdant. Each it is a little baby verdant force, and when you do hit the Sidious mm-hmm. Blessing, if they don't kill the Tender Shoot, you are going to win almost immediately. Yes. Basically, the game's yeah. over. Uh, last one, the Immortal Sun. I've actually that's the one that does a lot of stuff. It shuts off planeswalkers. It gets you an extra card on every turn. It makes your spells cost one less, and it pumps all your creatures plus one plus one. So I know the card is amazing, but I've actually never played with it or against it yet, which is crazy to think oh. about because I've done so many drafts of, of this format already. I've I've just never seen it. But I mean, yes, it, the card looks. Super powerful. It is expensive, uh, and the format is a little bit faster, so this type of effect isn't as good as mm-hmm. maybe in a slower format, of course, but it still looks yeah. great. Yeah, and it is. That card is yeah. awesome. I have yet to play with it myself, but I've played against it a few times, and I'm like, well, this changes things. It is beatable. Like you said, it's slow. I mean, the turn you cast it, it doesn't do anything. So, um, you know, I was able to beat it, but I've also lost to it. Like, th- they get to untap with it twice, and it's just oh, a yeah, game oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, one more thing to talk about. Maybe the most important thing, Kenji, for last. The Sailor of Means <laughs> deck. You and I were uh, poking around on Twitter on Saturday at the GP, and we saw that, uh, as you as you call him, the other Kenji. Yes. <laughs> Kenji Samura, the Hall of Famer uh, from Japan, had posted up a few uh, decks that he had drafted in one, and he had six Sailor of Means in one and five in the other. 
and you and I were like, to the laptops. And uh, we put on our, our lab mm-hmm. coats and started drafting Sailor of Means decks, thinking, here's the deal. Sailor of Means, it's in both sets, so you can get a bunch of them. It's a pretty darn good blocker at 1-4, and it works well against some of the menace creatures and some of the other stuff. And then it produces a treasure, which gets you one, uh, you know, two permanents towards the city's blessing, and also, of course, lets you splash around for a bunch of stuff um, to either ramp out to something big or to to cover, you know, three to three to five colors or whatever it is that you want. Um, I had some success with it, even though actually my first version I did win the draft, but I didn't have any actual <laughs> sailor of means. But I did dedicate a lot of picks to fixing, and I ended up playing a four color deck that ended up being pretty powerful. What has been your take? Is this for real? Is this something that we need to look out at? Are the pros at the Pro Tour going to be thinking about this deck, or is it was that just Kenji kind of running hot and having some fun? I, th- I think it's more running hot. Uh, now that's not to say it isn't a deck. I think the deck can be there. It's just. If you are going to do the true Sailor of Means deck, you need to have the win conditions. Like, you, you might just end up taking oh. all of the best cards in all of the colors, and maybe you can cast them, but if you don't pick up that win condition, maybe you just picked up all of the removal. If you just picked up all of the removal, then Sailor of Means dot deck is generally not going to do very well. Um, I had a deck this morning, actually, with four Sailor of Means, Itali, and Zakama, and... <laughs> the one time I cast a comma, it was an instant win. Uh, and it was pretty easy to cast given all of the treasures uh, in my deck, the four Sailor of Means and then a bunch of other methods. But the games that I didn't draw, either Atali or Zakama, I just instantly lost because all I was doing was playing one fours, playing a bunch of land, playing ways to survive, you know, removal. And then eventually right. they just killed me with like a 3-3 flyer because I didn't draw anything else. Oh, interesting. So make sure that you're prioritizing those those win cons. Now, what about uh, what about the more middling? Like, okay, sure, you got Zakama, but what about oh, I don't know, uh, Raging Regisaur or you know um, Hadana's Climb or Elenda or some you know uh, something like th- some of these cards that um, you'll see hanging around sometimes in the pack where they haven't quite found their home yet because, you know, they're, they're gold cards. Mm-hmm. Do you snap these up? Oh yeah, definitely. I think you almost okay. always want to take the higher power level cards and you want to try to wheel the sailor of means because people still don't give it the total respect it deserves. It was still a good card in, um, triple Ixalan. It's, yeah. it's, it's not great, obviously. Like a lot of the creatures are still evasive, but if you play two sailor of means that generally box, uh, everything in the early game. So, yeah, it, yeah, it does. And it, and it's quite good against the little one drops that people play off. And, yeah. um, and like you said, it opens, it opens up the door. What about removal? Do you, do you take a lot of removal as well? Because you can, you know, are you getting your bombards and your impales and that kind of stuff? Right. You, you also need to take removal heavily, uh, removal and bombs, of course, or bombs removal, I guess the start of bread is, is where you want to be. And then the sailor means and filler cards are just after okay. the fact. Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a fun deck to draft. It is. I really enjoyed playing it. It makes you think, and it it has a little bit of a tension, a uh, little bit of tension when they when they get one of those aggro curves because you can win, but you know you're gonna have to get a little lucky to do it. All right, great stuff, Kenji. Thanks so much for coming back on the show and giving us your first impressions of Rivals. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can they uh, check out your stream and all the stuff that you're up to? Sure. I'll, most commonly, you'll find me on twitch.tv slash Numot, the Nummy, N-U-M-O-T-T-H-E-N-U-M-M-Y, uh, streaming just about every weekday, internet barring, you know, I've had some internet issues <laughs> yeah. the last few days, but that's where I am most weekdays and then sometimes on the weekends if there's a just a fun event like a popper tournament I want to play. Uh, otherwise, you can contact me uh, on Twitter. Also, just search for Numot the Nummy and uh, YouTube, also Numot the Nummy. Everything, you just type Numot the Nummy, you're going to find me. That's basically it. Okay. And I'm going to, of course, put links to all three of these things in the show notes so that you don't have to go digging around if you want to catch up with Kenji on any of the many ways that he makes content. Um, you're going to find them in the links to the show notes on this very episode. Kenji, thanks a lot for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was fun. Uh, I want to remind you that the show is brought to you by channelfireball.com. If you want to uh, sell your cards, this is something that a lot of people get kind of lazy. I know I'm one of them, but gosh, do it before they rotate out and you can get sick value. You can just take that random pile of draft rares and you can send them to channel fireball and they'll give you a 30% bonus if you're trading it in, which is a big deal. That's a lot. That's, you know, you don't need that many before you get a box of rivals or, or something like that. 
And, uh, you know, you can also just get cash. You don't have to take the 30% for the trade and you can also just get money if you need that and, uh, turn those cards that are going to end up rotating and kind of losing all their value, turn them into cash or, or circuit it over at channel fireball. Dot com. If you want to find me on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR, and uh, you can find everything related to the podcast at LRcast.com, links to, to all of the stuff uh, that the show does. That's going to do it for this week. Thanks again to Kenji for coming on, and we will see you next week from the Pro Tour. Kenji, do you have a sign-off? Mm, no, not really. Oh, no. I was thinking well, about it. Your fans are going to be very disappointed in you. <laughs>